Good evening. My name is Li Yixong from the Artistry Department of Tsinghua University, and I'd like to thank the program for giving me this opportunity. Before discussing the four points of cave, which may sound puzzling, I'd like to present some background knowledge first. After the destruction of Gandharan culture in the middle fifth century, Zona workshop in eastern Afghanistan and Greater Kashmir started to play a major role in the religious art production of northwest India until the Islamic conquest. Given the paucity of historical documents, visual records are crucial in reconstructing the past. Thus, this post Gandharan workshops received Gandharan heritage and engaged in the Asian Buddhist world making. So, this study visualized the ties of major culture centers in Asia from a new perspective by the history of a specific costume, the Four Points of Cape. People once thought that this kind of costume is of Iranian or Indian origin, but archaeological findings show that it is first appeared in ancient Indara and then became widespread in Asia. And it transformed constantly to introduce the sensitive interests of different communities and thus varying further analysis. The rudimentary form of this cave are found in a group of sculptures of Kushan donors from the late Kandarian phase in the 3rd 4th century. Their texture symbolize kind of leather and give their simplicity in design. The original function of this kind of costume must have protection from the coat or weapons. Local craftsmen must have been familiar with this kind of costume as the sheep is always identical which suggests that the cave has existed for some time before its first appearance in sculptures. And later, the eastward expansion of the Sasanian Empire contributed to the export of Iranian visual tradition to northwest India. This compelling infusion of foreign styles drove the transformation of the cave. On this post from the Japanese private collection, we can see shapes of randos, crescents, and lobes, which are all Iranian borings. In this instance, the cape as an element of ceremonial dressing, along with the crown and the flying ribbons, highlights the figure's high social status. And as a beginning, the cape's tie with the Buddhist world in northwest India was not very strong. The production of Buddha status wearing the cave in Greater Gandhara started no later than the 5th century, and a well preserved example can be found on a statue meditating Buddha from the Jolian Buddhist monastery in Tatsila. This novel iconographic subject then expanded to adjacent areas like Hada and Swat. Some remain in affinity with the Iranian style, while others show decorative innovation and become more three-dimensional, more realistic. So, from this formal diversity, we can observe the beginning of an in-between period of artistic experiments. As Mahayana Buddhism permeated the Northwest, monks looked for inspiration in a well-established visual lexicon of kingship to underscore the similarity between Buddha, the ruler of Buddhist teachings, and kings, the ruler of secular society, in terms of authority. So at this time, Buddha status were decorated with a wide range of ornaments, necklaces, armlets, or crown in the Sanya and Vatonic fashion. So from that iconographic perspective, the four-pointed cape plays the same role. And after the end of the Gandharan period, on a workshop in Afghanistan and Greater Kashmir inherited its visual vocabularies. A formalized iconographic system, the so-called visual Buddha, was then established. The four-pointed cape became an important attribute of this icon, and the design of the cave started to move away from Gandhari models. So, to examine this donor style and exterior influences closely, I categorize the basement of the cave into four groups based on iconographic and formal factors. And group A is a typical Afghan type, containing three examples from the Buddhist monasteries in eastern Afghanistan from the short flat band necklace covering the cape's color, we can see the remaining of Gandharan fashion, but overall their flamboyant design featured multiple layers of fringes and patterns and complex floral ornaments contrast with the simple treatments of earlier Gandharan examples.
Another type of design featured with Iranian influence existed in the Nazar Art Center of Afghanistan, the Bamiya Valley. These examples of the cave used around those were small circles of regularity and the border with smooth edges for simple decoration. Although it is similar to dimensional visual effect, it is also apparent on some lake and daring structures. The design of Group B has no precedent and bears no dendaring feature, for instance the short flat necklace. Thus, this group marks the formation of a distinctive Bamiyan type. This type should have been influential to other Zona's workshops, for instance, the cave on the ground structure is carved with small circles. But at the end of the Buddhist phase in Afghanistan, examples of the cave in Group B received Kashmir's influence. Certain decorative units, such as a pair of pendants and a pair of circles attached to the upper point of the lower hand, is common in Greater Kashmir. So, Group C is of a typical Kashmir type. Examples of the cave in this group display not only a sense of regularity, but also a mixture of decorative elements from Group A. Most of the examples apply one or three roundels on the front, and the arrangement of these ornaments looks like examples from Group B, but they also show a preference for beaded fringes and litter, the flora ornaments, which relate to Group A. So, some scholars once debated that from which region did the workshop in Greater Kashmir borrow the four point cave Gandhara for Afghanistan? In my opinion, although basement of the cave from Greater Kashmir never copied in an Afghan model invariably, they indeed imitated the design of Afghan models. And all examples from Group C are totally different from Gandharian fashion. And instead, they show the influence of Gupta arts. The main body of some examples is almost like bears, only using small roundels attached to the upper point of the lower hand for a simple decoration. This localized Indian style becomes increasingly apparent on some structures with an esoteric or Hindu theme. And finally, we have group D. So in group A to group C, in most cases, the caves have a color covered by a beaded necklace. However, the color of specimen from group D is uncovered. It drops down loosely and naturally lets the texture of fabric, imitating the color of some gut tea. The culture of the Kashmir kingdom reached its high day during the 8th century when the Buddhist phase in Afghanistan was about to end due to the invasion of Muslims. So, Group D might mark the experimenting of a Zona workshop in this period, as sculptures with this structural feature were not replicated on a large scale. Now, from the formal analysis of the Four Points Cave, we can observe a historical linkage between Indara, Afghanistan, and Greater Kashmir, as well as their interactions with Persia and India. And besides that, it is puzzling why the Four Points Cave seems to lose its attraction in spots after its first appearance on the stucco fragments from the site of Shnaisha Rombots. The presence of foreign influence in Group A to Group D indicates that the material exchanges were extensive in Northwest India, so this absence of relevant images in spots might suggest certain local preferences. And yes, in terms of the spread of the four points in Cape, I would like to suggest two directions, Central Asia and China. Actually, samples of the cave from Sartiana can be dated in an early age. Local administrators in Sartiana might have imitated the representation of Kushan and Iranian rulers and borrowed the four-pointed cave from ancient Indara. These cave-like garments on seals and impressions that have beaded necklaces and patterns might be of great importance in revealing the stylistic origin of the cave from post-Indarian Afghanistan and Greater Kashmir. After the formation of the Bejeweled Buddha, Buddhist communities of Central Asia quickly accepted this iconographic system. Form evidence of this comes from the archaeological site of a Buddhist monastery in Old Merv, 
I'd like to propose that the Zen the grounded Buddha in the center is a faithful copy of such images from the Bamiyan Valley. However, it is very interesting that the cave itself is much more similar to the road carving of the grounded Buddha in Chilas, a greater Kashmir, adorning with a beaded necklace around the neck and the lower hand with two small circles attached to each upper point. So this object actually raises more questions for further exploration. Given their trading activities with nearby settlers, it is conceivable that in the 8th century, the Diana people still knew the scale from its design to its, its implication. In mirrors from Penchken, the female figure wearing the cape appeared many times. Her cape is simply adorned it with rondos and apparently it was buttoned on a Bamiyan model. Another interesting point is that in Northwest India and early Sarsiana, viewers of this cave are all male, but in Panchkin, the viewer is female. But this woman has been interpreted as a daughter of an ancient hero or king, so she is still a member of the ruling class and has a quality of kingship. And then the four points it came might be introduced to Western Asia as a part of a formalized pardon. In one piece of textile produced by a Byzantine domestic workshop, we can observe a hunter or a king wearing a cape over a tunic. Even though some motifs in this image derive from Sasanian art, such as the flying ribbons, the parandos on the tunic, and the scene of royal hunting, the patron of this type of cape with triangular hem were rare in Persia. This male figure is likely to be derived from Central Asia imagery or more specifically, Sotiana. This image also indicates that the costume's implication of kingship is unchanged in the secular world. And finally, let us move to East Asia. On the southern Buddha relief on the Legutai cave, Roman grottoes, we can find Buddha wearing the four pointed cape. And this cape used connecting bees as a border, which indicates a stylistic connection with the specimen from early Central Asia and Group A from Afghanistan. They also wear a short multiple strand beaded necklace like the necklace of the terracotta bust from the Buddhist monastery of Fondukistan. On a painting from Dunhuang, however, we can see a crowned Buddha wearing a cape, he is touching the earth, and this is actually features of the Bodhigaya image prevailing in the Middle Town period. So it has been regarded as a combination of the crowned Buddha image from Northwest India and the Bodhigaya image from India. The cape in this image has pendant and a collar covered by a beaded choker. We can also see the pair of shoulder decoration in Kashmir fashion. Thus, this cape might have adapted from the model from Greater Kashmir, but its shape looks like a flower in bluesome. So, maybe to follow the train of varying flower patterns in the Tang Dynasty, Chinese craftsmen redesigned the shape of the cape. And in the future, I'd like to explore the connection between the Gandharan four-pointed cape and another traditional Chinese costume, Yunjian, that became popular in the Song Nanjing dynasty. And finally, although the earliest four-pointed cape displayed formal diversity, it was a local fashion in ancient Gandhara. As a separate item, it is less possible for ordinary people to introduce it to the outside world, but um, the involving Buddhist ideology knows the kind of costume with religious qualities, and Zona Workshop in post Gandhara in Northwest India welcomed it as a part of Gandharan visual lexicon that facilitated its spread to other parts of Asia, and it deserved an iconographic element that continues to transform to items with the aesthetic preference of varying secular or religious communities. And by taking this object-based angle, we can observe its long journey along the Silk Road, and we demonstrate its closeness with the Buddhist societies during the late antique and early medieval times. This long forgotten traditional costume can actually become a piece of visual evidence demonstrating the vitality of the Gandhari material culture and the transculturality of Asian Buddhist world-making. Yeah, here is a reference and thank you all for attention. Thank you very much.